Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Harold Nilsson. I'm the CEO of Seacross Marine. Uh, we manufacture and develop uh, navigation systems, especially designed for safe, high-speed uh, navigation. I'm going to talk about the GPS-denied high-speed navigation, and it's divided into threats and uh, sensor limitations, and also limitations in the navigation systems when it comes to GPS denial. And I will also talk about mitigation using Seacross uh, technologies. There are a lot of threats to the GNSS, or more commonly uh, named uh, the GPS system, uh, but they consist predominantly of jamming and spoofing. And jamming means that one just hits the system and, and the, um, the airways with so much power that uh, the entire system is blocked. Oh, sorry. And it doesn't need very much power, and uh, because the transmitters of the GPS systems are so weak that what you receive here at the face of the Earth is a very, very, very weak signal. And as a comparison, just for a human being to understand, it's the equivalent of a 20-watt light bulb at a distance of 21,000 kilometers. And one quite easily understands, you know, without being an engineer, that this is very easily blocked, and it can be blocked by almost anybody. Spoofing is the other part, and that is a technology where you actually enter um, an offset into the GPS system uh, packaging, and that will generate an offset in navigation system. And it can be an instant offset, or which is even worse, it can be a drifting offset that gradually moves the data that you have in your system. One might think that this is you know, extremely difficult to acquire this kind of equipment needed, but it's not. On the contrary, today you can go on the web, I looked myself, and for $50 you can buy a, you know, <coughs> a GPS jammer. It could be a very simple one, like you know, a USB stick or something you plug into your car in the, in the um, uh, lighter outlet. Or it can be a little bit more advanced, the more you pay, the more you get, and you can see on the right-hand side more advanced Russian systems. So what kind of uh, damage can they do? It's you don't need very much power at all. One tenth of a watt will give you approximately you know, one nautical mile of, of blockage or jamming. One watt will give you 25 kilometers, oh sorry, nautical miles. And 10 watts, 80 nautical miles. And as you can see from the, the if we put this in here in, in Göteborg or Gothenburg, we would reach you know, across you know, Fredrikshamn on the other side of Denmark with just a cheap maybe a couple of hundred dollar uh, jammer that we buy on the net. This is a serious threat. And we see a lot of reports coming in on multiple incidents all <coughs> over the world. From airports that have to shut down, there have been incidents in Gatwick, in Newark Airport and so forth, all over the world. And uh, some people are just playing with it, but it's also used you know, for criminal purposes to block detection of, of things moving or fleet control. There was an incident, I think it was uh, in Gatwick, and Every Thursday they had problems, you know, they had to shut down the airport for a couple of hours around noon. And it turned out that it was a truck driver who didn't want anyone to know what he was doing during lunch. So he had one of these small jammers he plugged into his um, uh, lighter outlet in his truck and then he went and did something very close to the, um, to the uh, airfield. I don't know what he did, but he didn't want anyone to know it. It took them some time to figure it out, but can you imagine the consequences of all this? And if one person can do that for $50, you know, this is not going to be very nice in the future. Of course, if you look at the right-hand um, end of my previous slides, you know, you see that bigger military systems, they're actually built to do damage. And of course, this is not open information, you know, what kind of range and how far they can reach. But just to give you an idea of the capabilities, there was a... Almost two years ago, the U.S. military you know, conducted a, a jamming test in Southern California. And prior to that test, the FAA, the Federal uh, Aviation Authority, they issued a, a warning to all aviators that within a radius of 250 nautical miles, the GPS system will be blocked at an elevation of only 15 meters and much further, you know, further out. And if we put this into the perspective here, if we would have one of those transmitters here in, Got in Gothenburg today, it would reach you know, Hamburg, Oslo, Stockholm. It doesn't take very much to block this system that we are also very dependent on. 
And unfortunately, we get a lot of reports of reoccurring events like this. Uh, a little bit less than a year ago, Russia and uh, Belarus, they had a, a joint exercise called Sabad, which means West, and uh, along the west, their western borders. And uh, both uh, in Latvia parts, in Norway and also in Sweden, one could you know, see that you know, the system was totally blocked. And it, there have been other incidents. Uh, used drones have been affected in Syria. There are reports of, of uh, jamming in both in Crimea and in, uh, in eastern Ukraine, etc. So this is some. It's a real threat. It's not something that will happen in the future. It's here now. What's even worse is spoofing, because it's much more difficult to detect. You do understand if you have no GPS system, because you get no fix. But spoofing, you could just move your position to somewhere else. Or even worse, gradually drift, which is even more difficult to, to uh, detect. It works using two different principles, uh, essentially. You receive, you add an offset, and you retransmit. Or you receive, you record, and then you retransmit with a slight delay. And it's enough to create you no know, disturbance of this. Again, there are uh, a lot of examples of this. One just very recent, it was more less than a year ago, outside the bigger Russian um, uh, commercial harbor in, in the Black Sea. There was this commercial ship. The captain was just about to lift his anchor and, and depart. When he, looking at his navigation system, he concluded that he was not at all where he thought he was. He was 32 kilometers inland on the Gelendzik airport. And that was very disturbing, of course. So they double-checked you know, all their systems, and nothing was wrong. So then they checked you know, all the AIS targets that they got into their system. And all the other neighboring ships, they were also dislocated. So they were all at the airport. And no one could detect this, except just realizing that this is nuts. And maybe that's not a good enough you know, technology to, to counter these threats. So, in conclusion, this has been a growing you know, threat since many, many years, and it's increasing. And since it's so easily attainable, anyone can get hold of this you know, technology. It's going to get worse. That's my belief, anyway. The spoofing technologies will also evolve and become more and more efficient and more difficult to detect. The GPS system will surely have to be complemented with other types of technologies, like eLoran and other types of positioning system. So one can rely on something else when this happens. Now, if we look at the sensor and navigation system, <coughs> excuse me, limitations. In principle, yeah, we have a GPS receiver. It will deliver some kind of position and navigational data to the navigation system, and everything is fine. But when it's jammed, it just stops. And you, as a navigator, you go totally blind unless you have any any other means, you know, to navigate with. There are a few you know, methods one can use to mitigate this. You can connect a grid or two or three or four or, or multiple GPS receivers. They usually have you know, slightly different characteristics depending on the, 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 the brand and the make. And then you can put them together. And some navigation system can weigh all this data. And then it will give you some kind of best estimate of what is your actual position. They are more resilient and they could withstand you know, jamming a little bit better. One of them might you know, fall out, one will be intermittent, and one might work. So in consequence, you will have a slightly more dependable system. But it's not something that you can totally rely on. One can go one step further, and you can complement this with an INS, like a laser gyro. Uh, and that will continue to give you your position, at least for a while, even when the GPS receivers are, you know, for some reason, disrupted or, or do not give you a correct position. But um, <coughs> so this is a, a little bit of a mitigation, but it's not something that you can trust for a longer period of time because the INS needs a little bit of feed so you can recalculate. And if that's, that feed is disrupted or wrong, the INS will gradually you know, drift into something you don't want. So if you spoof these systems and introduce an offset, the GPSs, they will give you the... Uh, Gelendisk uh, airport somewhere in, in uh, Russia. But the INS will not take that. It will still continue to feed you with the correct position. So from that perspective, you know, a combination of uh, multiple GPS and receivers 
and an INS will guarantee that you, at least for a while, can detect this kind of, of activity. But if you have a drifting offset, the INS will be fooled because the seed that it gets from the positioning system will gradually move also the INS you know, somewhere in another direction. So, what can we say about this? Well, it's not encouraging at all. Because the, the whole situation is really a bit scary, actually, I would say. Because if we have an infrastructure that is totally dependent on this kind of positioning data, and suddenly it goes gone, or is wrong, and you might not even be able to detect that it is wrong, then there is a problem. Hopefully, there is some mitigation. That's why I'm standing here. And uh, there are GPS receivers that can detect spoofing, and there are all kinds of more advanced systems. But they cannot do the full trick. You can jam also the most unjammable you know, GPS receiver. Encrypted, not encrypted, it's just gone. And you can see it doesn't take very much, almost nothing. At Seacross, we have been working with this for many, many years. And uh, it all originated with um, the small sealed delivery uh, vehicle, the submarine, that is here in the harbor. And that kind of, of technology we have used for positioning and, and uh, navigation submerged, which means the same thing is being jammed, basically. And what we have set up as, as a criteria for this assisted active navigation functionality that we named it AAM, is that it should be no latency jamming detection. Low, no latency spoofing detection and correction. And it should combine passive sensors and active sensors. You cannot always use active sensors. Maybe you just don't want to go through uh, being you know, not seen. And it has manual semi-automatic and automatic correction. Now, at the core, there's this dead reckoning module. It can be a simple one, just you know, with a rate gyro and, uh, and the panel lock for you know, a couple of hundred or three, four or five hundred um, uh, dollars. And the secret system is self-calibrating. So even if you have small you know, errors or m big errors in heading or, or in speed through water, the system will compensate. So you can actually rely on this quite uh, uh, well. They can be combined with or replaced with an, uh, a laser gyro or something else that is substantially more expensive. It's more a question of what kind of accuracy one wants. But in principle, you get the same result. Now, this uh, the reckoning module, it feeds the Seacross navigation system with position, you know, heading, and speed. And the navigator can constantly correct his own position, you know, depending on his own assessment. And you do it very easily just by double-clicking in the C-chart. And we'll take a new fix, and then we'll continue to do the directing from there. So you can actually, as you go, on the go, you can correct your own position all the time. It doesn't matter if you're blocked or spoofed or whatever. But it's up to the navigator. The secrets will not make the decision for you. It will give you the tools. Now, we don't have any water here, do we? Hmm? Thank you. I'll continue to talk anyway. Uh, <coughs> So on the left-hand side here, there are several different types of tools that you can use to uh, enter the corrections into the system. It's either line of positioning or running fix, and you can use you know, traditional methodology. You can just look and then kind of estimate, or you can use a compass to pale and get the bearings, or you can use you know, head-up displays that you can see out here. You just look at something, click, and you look at something, click, and you look at something, click, and there you go. You know where you are. And that's a process that takes maybe two, three seconds. So one can actually sustain high speeds safely just by doing this line of positioning or running fix, using that as a feedback into the system and as a correction that will go into the dead reckoning module. One can use the EBL from the, from the radar, or one can use optical you know, bearing devices. There are all kinds of you know, methodologies to do this. Thank you very much. Um, but we have also now we introduced lately two more uh, functions that kind of completes you know, the circle as far as we can see. To begin with, there is an inbuilt you know, way to detect spoofing. And it's real time. It's not something that calculates and tells you that 10 minutes ago, your position was probably not correct. This is instant, or within one or two seconds. We also use the same you know, base data to, to calculate using radar gr gridlock algorithms, exactly where we are based on the radar input only. 
And then you're totally you know, independent on the GPS system. So how does it work? Well, you have the dead reckoning module that will constantly calculate through its algorithms where you are based on the input it gets. If you get jammed, the system will automatically you know, switch over to, to uh, estimate the position move and run like that. And the way you will see that is that the, 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 the vessel symbol will change you know, color and shape and it will give you the red one is your last known fix. And then it will continue to calculate and it will move on like this. If you're spoofed, you can do the same thing, but then it's up to the navigator to actually invoke the system, the, 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 um, the dead reckoning system. It will not do it automatically because it's a decision of the navigator or the captain. Then when you enter your position correction, you can see here you had your last uh, fix here, and then through LOP or whatever method you used, this is the your estimated position. You double click on that, and it will reposition. That was your last known fix, and then it will continue to calculate. So it means that with very simple means, very quickly, within seconds, you can constantly correct your position, which in, in the end allows you to, with high speed and uh, with safety, sustain the the course that you have. Now, spoofing detection is built on a completely different you know, thinking and methodology. In, in CCROSS, we have what we call NTE functionality, and it's uh, a predict predictor that will predict what the next radar sweep should look like based on your own position and the, and the chart data. And the way it's presented to the navigator is that it's overlaid on top of each other. And if it's supposed to be there, it will be there in one color. If it's not supposed to be there, it means it's non-charted, probably a vessel or something else. And it will show up in an alternate color. And as you can see here, it appears that you know, the radar and the GPS system, you know, they agree that we're on the same place, in the same place. Here is, there is an animality, and that's a, a vessel moving. Because it's not charted, so it will be displayed in a different color. Enabling the navigator to instantly you know, uh, identify a moving object, dangerous one. But this can also be used for spoofing detection. Because the radar and the GPS system, they have to agree that we're in the same place. And at the end of the day, ra the radar is always right. So if you have a deviation, if you're being spoofed, which means that the GPS system will feed the wrong position, like you know, the airport there in, in, uh, in Russia, they will go apart. So the radar and the GPS system will have a different opinion about you know, where we are. And as you can see on the right-hand side here, you, you get a, a deviation, will which will indicate that you're being spoofed, but you can also assess you know, to what extent. Now, the radar grid lock algorithm actually does that for you. So it uses you know, quite advanced algorithms and automatically tries to, to uh, with image recognition, put the radar image and the C chart that w where we think we are together, and eventually it will give you a match, and that will be your position, and that can be entered back into the system. And again, it's not done automatically, but it's presented to the navigator as its estimated position, with a circle that's proportional to the confidence that the the um, uh, radar gridlock algorithm has. So by using this, you can double click here again. You will get your new fix, and then you, the dead reckoning module will continue to calculate for you. So with very small means, you can actually correct your position constantly using this assisted active navigation you know, functionality. So having said that, any questions? No. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, in an open sea with no radar uh, echoes, the grid lock algorithm will be you know, very confused, of course. So, but, but it can actually be quite efficient. There are certain areas where it cannot work at all. If you have no radar return, there's nothing to, you know, to make any image recognition. I'm, I mean, you can conclude that you're out in the open water. And maybe that has a little bit of value too, to know that you're not you know, close to land. But that's about it. If you, if you on one hand, say on your starboard side, you have a very straight coastline and nothing else, 
If it's a perfect coastline, I'd say you're better off just looking out the window yourself. You know. but, but as soon as you have something that can be uniquely identified, and it could be that the, the coastline is not straight. You have a little bay or a little peninsula going, it's enough. And, and, and the matching is actually quite good. Now, we have been using the, this um, dead reckoning mo module for many, many years. This is a proven concept. The radar grid lock algorithm, we have been using for quite some time. And we're not done yet you know, assessing and quantifying you know, uh, exactly how, is, uh, how exact it will be. But we know now that it's exact enough to, c to continue at high speeds you know, with full safety. So, any more questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. And then the flight plan is not covered by that system. Well, it will become less and less. Sorry? If you have a current or, or, or other conditions in the water that uh, you cannot measure, the dead reckoning will be less dead, I would say. So uh, the, the problem is really that the currents will offset you know, the dead reckoning module. In Seacross, we have functionality inbuilt for that. So you can actually manually, as, a, as an uh, navigator, you can add an offset yourself, both you know, in, in the speed, heading, and transversal speed, too. So even if you have a side current, you can add, say, I have two, two knots from starboard. And then you can uh, enter that into the system, and it will use that during its calculations. Yes? If I understood you correctly, the question is, can the radar automatically update the position? Yeah, right. Yes, it could. But in secrets, we have one single solid principle. The system never makes a decision. It's the navigator that makes the decision. So what the system will do is present all the available data for the navigator to, talk, to actually make his own decision. And there are two reasons for that. You know, but, but the main reason is really that if you have a system with four automatic fallback options. Say we have three GPSs, one goes dead. If you have an automatic system, it will switch to the second one. But it might not necessarily be that the navigator will see that. And then the second one is gone too, and then he wants to invoke you know, the last one, and that was gone a long time ago. So, so automated you know, fallback options are very convenient, but not necessarily safe. So one could do that, we will not do that. It will be instead, just like I showed here. You will see what the radar gridlock you know, algorithm kind of concluded, this is where you are. And then it's up to you to decide if this is correct or not. Yeah, but this is more, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you invoke the, like, I, let's see if I, Uh, could you invoke the, the, uh, this, the reckoning module manually instead of just letting the GPS system go bad? Was that the... Uh well, that's what you do here. It's the same thing. But the difference is that you can, you can invoke you know, this dead reckoning uh, manually as a navigator if you want to. And that means in practice that you actually let the radar you know, gridlock algorithm guide you. But we, we, we do not and we won't turn this into an automatic you know, position update. It's, not, it's the navigator that makes the decision. And I'll just translate that too. I, <laughs> I can take more questions outside. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>